Great job, church. Oh, man. Man, Marshall, what is that thing? I love that. I, that iPad is smoking. And man, I love a church where it's an honor to lift up his word. Amen? Hey, we start a brand new series today. Can't wait to get into it. We're not going to go long, but boy, we've got some great stuff for you. Turn with me to the book we're going to be in for the next several weeks as we approach even the holidays. Go to Philippians with me, family. Philippians chapter 1. And if you're here today and you're going, you know what? i got to get my hands on a Bible and you don't have one, stop by the Palms bookstore as soon as we're done. You know, we have those Bibles there, all sorts of different versions, sizes, styles, and we have those things marked down so that they don't profit the church, but they'll be a great benefit to you. You want to get your hands on the marvel of this great book. And as we go ahead and we study together this wonderful thing, and we're talking about today, Unimagined Joy. That is the series we're going to lead off with it here in the next few moments. And as we read together, there's a lot that God has got for us. And I want us to do this. Would you join with me and turn it? I'm not going to talk long. We're going to jump right into the scriptures together. And then we'll kind of explain a little bit. Notice with me. This is uh, Paul. When he writes this, guys, ladies, he's in his early 60s. In fact, he's in prison. And he doesn't know it, of course. But within eight years he's going to be executed. And uh, if you go, man, did he, did he have any idea it was coming? Sure he did. You go, how do you know? If you read 2 Timothy chapter 4, these are the final words of a man who knows soon he is going to have his head severed from his body at the hand of Nero. And when you read it, it is a celebration. He knows where he's going. He has no doubt. You know the verse, 2 Timothy 4, 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I, Paul writes, have kept the faith. This morning, may he grow faith to you and I. Let's read eight years before that time, this great, great book. And may I say this in the outset? There is no book. Anybody know how many letters or epistles he wrote, Paul wrote? My goodness, Judy, not only are you right, you're in the front row. <laughs> 13. He wrote 13, and out of the 13 he wrote, not a one is like Philippians. It's his warmest. It's his, uh, 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 he's the closest to the people he's writing to. He's very, very transparent. And it's a book, well, it's called the Epistle of Joy. Let's find out why. It says this, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. He says, I always pray, how new venture? With, this is the first time we see it, and we're gonna see it throughout this short book. He says, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Notice how he's writing. He's not writing like we've seen in Romans or Thessalonians or Colossians, even Ephesians. He's talking about having the affection of Jesus Christ. He says, I long for all of you. I pray for you often. And when I think about you, I'm praying with joy. All of this good stuff. And then he goes on. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and to the praise of God. Now you read this first part, it all sounds great. I mean, you would think he's uh, maybe watching a sunset, uh, maybe there's a, a breeze blowing through the Middle East, and it's all good. But then he tells us his situation, the environment he's writing in. He says here, 
says, now, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am, what new venture? Notice there, I am in chains in Christ, he goes on and says here. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others do it out of goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But then he says other people, the former, they preach Christ with ulterior motives. He says they preach Christ because of selfish ambition and sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm here, he says it again, while I am in these chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, he says, here's that word again, I rejoice. Now remember, keep it in your mind, 16 times in this chapter, he's going to mention joy or rejoicing, and then he turns it on you and I and encourages us here in California, thousands of miles from where he wrote, 2,000. 1800 years, I mean, so many centuries later to enjoy, rejoice in the same way that he mentions here. He says, yes, and I'm gonna continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ is gonna be exalted in my body whether I'm alive or whether I die, whether by life, the Bible says, or by death, and I love this. For me, to live is Christ and to die is what, guys? Man, he says it's game. You know what he's saying? He says, hey, <laughs> it's graduation day. It's promotion time. He says, man, if I'm alive, now I wanna keep talking about Jesus Christ to get more people to go where I'm headed. And he says, and when I die, Man, it is, it is, it couldn't get any better. He says to die is even better. What does he know that you and I don't? I've asked New Venture before. I said, how many of you want to go to heaven? Every hand goes up. I ask you, how many want to die to get there? There might be just a couple of hands. We want to go to heaven, but we also don't want to die to get there. Paul is the exact opposite. He says, oh man, live us for Christ. I got to stick around here. But to die, man, it's even better. And he goes on and says this. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean faithful labor for me. Yet at what shall I choose? I don't really know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be. Man, this guy is so in love with the Lord. Man, he goes, I'm ready for the Lord to beam me up and to be with him, which is, far, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. Convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress. And here that word, third time already. We're still in half of chapter one. And joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Oh man, I just love this. I can't wait in the next several weeks and what we're gonna dive into. This, this book, we are gonna learn a course about Jesus. We're gonna understand the depth of what joy is all about. We're also gonna look in life, the kind of life you and I live, what are the joy killers that you and I have to endure? We're also gonna look at how you and I can find happiness beyond the holidays. This is the time of year, everyone's talking about time of season of joy and it's all good, it doesn't last. How do you enjoy, how do you allow the good vibes and feelings you sometimes get during the holiday seasons to extend into 2019? Or in spite of your life situation and circumstance, how can we know the joy that Paul is talking about here? And here is a guy that's got a real bad situation going on. Now remember, he is in a place called Philippi. Philippi came into being in 368 BC. 
beautiful place. It is between Europe and Asia. And uh, in fact, you'll see on the screen here in just a minute, it gives you a great set. That is modern day Philippi. It has been excavated at some length. Here, you've got the, for, here in the foreground, this is the forum area. This part would have been back here, would have been the center of the city. And then when you went way to the back, you would have Greek plays that took place in their amphitheater. Their amphitheater has been excavated and that's how it looks today. Absolutely beautiful. When Paul was in there, there was only 2,000 people in the whole city of Philippi at the time. That's why everybody knew about Paul. You know, I had, I had twice as many um, fellow students at the high school I went to, and maybe you as well, 4,000 in my high school, only 2,000 in Philippi at the time. We're going to read later that everybody understands what he is going through and the situation that he's experiencing. You see, well, who developed it? I mean, how did it come into being? If I was to ask you how many know the name Alexander the Great, probably every hand would go up. Alexander the Great had conquered the known world. Alexander the Great had conquered the world by the time he was 33 years of age. In fact, the only problem he had, great general, but he could not get off the alcohol and died of a shattered liver. Bad situation. He died at 33. They said he wept after he conquered the world and said there's no place left to conquer. When he conquered this area, he named it after his son, Philip. And this is where we get this Philippi. And it's also, it's the closest one we've mentioned. Now, no, now notice this. Anytime you read this great book, you'll notice that when you read the New Testament and it starts, it always starts telling you who the author is of the book. Notice the, at the very beginning, first word. He says, Paul. And then he goes in, Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. You see, that's how they do it in the Middle East. In the Middle East, when they write a letter, they start with the author. Now out west here, you and I in America, it's the opposite, isn't it? You've got to write that email, you've got to write out that letter, and you, don't, you wait till the very end to say, hey, God bless, sincerely, or whatever you say, and you put the name at the end. Back there, it always started at the beginning. So he's saying, I'm the author of this, I'm writing this to you. And then as he begins to write, he starts to explain all these various things to us, and what we understand, he was in this prison at a very, very, I mean, here he was in his early 60s. He was awaiting the situation that he was about to encounter. And what happens, what I think is fascinating as we read this together, in the first chapter, he talks about relationships. And I think, he, I think, I think God did that by design. We understand that relationships, you know, you can have, you don't have to have money issues. Maybe you don't have health issues. Maybe you've got great opportunities in life. But would you agree with me that if things are wrong with other people and you, life can still stink? It really can. And I think that's why God gave us this book. Because he's talking about joy, but he's speaking about individuals. You know, this is really cute. I noticed, and I don't know if, if this dear friend is here this morning, but we had a guy, um, I was looking at Facebook last week, and somebody actually attended the church, wrote this in their entry in Facebook. A great picture too. I was out on the pier. You could see the ocean of the Pacific behind them. You could tell it was a beautiful day. And the person wrote on Facebook, he says here, uh, getting, what's he say? Getting out, oh, getting out and just taking in the beautiful views can really change your negative opinions about people. I mean, this thing started off good. I mean, look at that, the views. You can look at the picture and go, oh, that is beautiful. But he says, this makes me forget the negativity of other people. You guys, remember that decal that says, uh, the more I spend time around people, the more I like my dog? <laughs> oh, oh, man. And I think, I think because we are sometimes that way, Philippians is given to you and I to talk about if you want to have joy, you got to make sure that you are dialed in in general with other people. And he's going to show us how to do this here in this great, great book. And uh, he goes on and notice with me for a minute, boy, several things I want you to really catch here. Write this in your notes real quick. Remember, I said we're just going to uh, uh, go over the top this morning for a few minutes. Of the 13 books of the New Testament written by Paul, Philippians is the most, would you please put down, it is the most personal, it is the most positive book that you read 
of all the writings that the Apostle Paul has given you and I. And notice with me, boy, in fact, it's a letter of thanks. I mean, he is so grateful, he is so thankful. There's thanks, there's encouragement, there's gratitude. It's all positive. Just really, really good stuff. But, understand, but look at his circumstances that he's encountering. First of all, he's considered a criminal. In spite of how positive it is, he's viewed as a criminal. And the reason why we know, he mentions this over and over and over again. We just read it. He also was chained to a Roman soldier the whole time that he was going through this time of incarceration. And the third thing you see down there, this is really interesting. Here's a guy that finds himself under house arrest. You know, this verse I put in parentheses here, 2 Timothy 1.16. When you read that, he says, I get it. It's easy to be ashamed because I've got these chains on me. I mean, chains were a symbol of something to be ashamed of. And yet Paul has still got this incredible joy. I want to go, how do you do that? How do you experience that? Now understand, see, the kind of prison he was in wasn't the kind where he, where he ended up dying because that was a dungeon in Rome. These subterranean cells were dank, dark. They say it was infested with vermin and sickness. You would be in those places and often contact leprosy because it was so bad. He wasn't in there when he wrote this. In fact, he was about 4,200 miles away in Rome from the Philippians. Now remember, in Rome, you, you know, we're talking about Italy. Philippi is in Greece. It's thousands of miles away. And you've got this man, he's in something that doesn't look exactly like this, but you get the idea. I mean, it's got a door, just like the door of your house. And what he was in was a rented house, didn't have bars like this, but it probably had something like you see on the screens. And see, Paul was put in, and when he writes this, he's put inside, and Paul is confined to his home for two years, two years, long years. And not only that, that's not the worst of it, I don't think. I think the worst of it is this. They had a chain that extended from a Roman soldier and these guys would rotate a quarter of a day, every day through the night. He was continued to be chained. Paul was never given a break. He was not set free. The positive side, he was allowed to write. This is why we get he wrote Philippians from his house cell. He wrote Ephesians. He wrote this book called Philemon. In fact, what happens is four of the epistles he wrote while he was in his home, in that cell. That's why for those who study the Bible, you often hear the phrase, the prison epistles. The prison epistles, like Philippians, was written while he was under house arrest, chained to a soldier. Now, at least without a chain, you could go to the window and look out, just like that dear friend in our church who was writing, man, oh man, I love the views. It gets my mind off of people. But what happens if you can't look out of your cell because it looks like this? It's been now barred off. And the, the worst part of it is, is the fact that you are chained and you are not getting away from that Roman soldier. And he hadn't done a thing. And yet he can say in the midst of all of this, oh, oh man, I've got joy in my heart. I continue to rejoice. And then he encourages you and I to do that. Man, I'm going to tell you what, family, I want to know the secret of being in a bad environment and yet still being able to have joy in my heart. And not because we're hearing Christmas music, but because God put a new song in your heart and in spite of things that should tweak you, tick you off, upset you, you're going, no, I am marching to the beat of a different drummer. Can somebody say amen this morning? Oh man, 
And that can be me and you. And we're going to get the secret of that as we see down here in the scriptures. And notice with me, if you would, write this down a little bit further here. I mean, boy, and here's words he's going to talk about. He says he was shamed. And you see, we've defined that. That means he is embarrassed. He is humiliated. He says because of his situation. He says he is being bad-mouthed. Ever had any of those happen? Sure. Somebody saying things that hurt your heart, affect your feelings, humiliated, shamed. He says, me being in this, you, he says, word is out that I'm in chains. And they knew what that meant. He was chained to another human being that would not allow him to leave his house. And then notice with me, if you would, real fast here. He says, Paul maintains a generally, I love this. Would you write down a jubilant spirit? He, how do you do that when your environment is so bad? That's what Philippians is all about. You see, Philippians is going to teach you and I, you see it down there, how to keep your head up. How do you keep your head up when life's got you down? Anybody want to know the secret of that? Oh, and hey, City Church, I know you guys are with us today. How about you? Amen. Write this down if you would, please. Would you put down experiencing. Let's get this word, unimagined joy. I mean, you can't imagine it in the natural. How do you experience a joy in spite of outward circumstances? I'm going to tell you what, man. I feel like the Lord wants to turn you and I loose and give us the keys to unlocking the door to find the answer to this. So number one, there's four keys to enjoying people. And this is a great precursor for you and I. As tomorrow uh, or I should say next week, many of you are going to come to first service. As soon as first service is over, you're going to head about seven miles away to the Oceanside Senior Citizen Center, and you're going to meet a whole bunch of other new venture people who are waiting for you. You'll be given your name tag. We've got crafts for the kids. We've got hair cutters and, and, and beard trimmers for those who, who desire that. We're looking for hygiene items so we can give that to the dear folks. There'll be all sorts of food and a lot of things going on. We want you and God wants you and I to look on those people, imagining that outside of God's grace, somebody would be serving you this Thanksgiving. Amen. What a privilege God's given us. Number one, you know, one thing, there's four things real quick. Appreciate the good in people. You know, it's a whole lot easier to get along with folks if you consciously are thinking, Lord, help me appreciate the good in so-and-so. And you know where I get that? Look at verse 3. It's right there underneath. I love that verse. It says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, that verse I first read, it must have been close to over 40 years ago. It's one of my favorite verses. Paul is, he so appreciates people. He says, I thank the Lord every time I think about you. You know, here in California, when a house appreciates what happens, it goes up in value. When you appreciate people, you look for the good and you know what happens? Your appreciation for, for them makes them more valuable in your sight and you go, you know what? Nobody's all bad. Nobody's all good. Paul down here breaks it down. And then boy, in his background in Acts chapter 16, boy, he writes this in 50 AD. Or excuse me, the church started in 50 AD. Now it's about 10 years later and he's writing this book for us. He says, you've helped me from the very first day until now. Notice Paul is just lavishing positives, praise, thanks, appreciation. He goes, even my thoughts are great when I think about you. Write down number two. He said, boy, and you know what you want to do? Man, this will be new for some of us. You want to pray God's blessings on folks. You go, how do you do that? Anytime you go and you talk to somebody, whether it's on the campus, in the locker room, on the playing field, at the workforce, anytime you say, hey, hey, God bless you, when you walk away consciously, think to yourself, pray a blessing on the person you just said, God bless you. It changed your attitude towards them right away. It's great. 
I mean, there's not anyone that, or I try for it not to be anyone, that I'll say, hey, God bless you, without walking away and going, Lord, yes, please do that, whatever the need is, just bless them today. Something that simple. Praying God's blessings. Paul tells us down here, he says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy for you. And what do you pray when you want God's blessings? Hey, in your small groups this week, you're gonna be talking about some of this. Boy, hey, that they grow in love. That they grow in love. Love with God, love with other people. Number two, that they make wise choices. All of us need to do that. That is a great prayer you can pray on somebody else. That they would be right with God. Maybe they know him, but maybe they're in a hurting place, a bad season. That they're right with God. Number four, to live for his glory. See, we need to be praying this for ourselves as well. But if you're going, well, what do I pray for people? Take those four in that shaded box and try one of those. That's praying a blessing on others. Get it? Great, family. Try it and watch what it does for you as well as for them. Number three. Oh, man, sometimes this gets hard. Believe the best in other people. Believe the best. You go, what, what do we, let me tell you what we normally do. Boy, here's our mistake. You see it down there further? We judge, the, we judge others by how far they have to go rather than how far they have come. I mean, we look at others and it's very easy to judge and be negative and think, what's, what's her problem? What's his problem? And we're just naturally negative because I'm thinking, man, they got a long way to go. Instead of thinking, we have no idea of their life situation, the family they were born into, the life experiences they've gone through and encountered. Maybe they're doing a whole lot better than we could imagine if we were in the same situation. I love Paul's words. Oh, I love it. He's just being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Man, I love that stuff. He who began a good work in you is not finished yet. Let me ask you this morning, how many of you would say honestly that you don't believe you've seen your finest hour yet? How many of you believe that God's got something even better for you and you haven't experienced yet? Man, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm in the right church this morning. I absolutely believe that with you as well. And in the same way, it is believing the best. Paul does that. And number four, ask God to touch your heart. Ask God to touch your heart. Here's what he says. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Some of us and all of us, we need to sometimes go, God, will you jumpstart my heart? You can have a bad attitude and it's easy to develop it for all of us. But you Lord, please touch my heart. There is a, a church that did that just several weeks ago and they put it on Facebook and it went viral. And I think it's a great precursor for you and I as we wind down our time this morning and as we get ready to touch a lot of wonderful lives next week. This is only two and a half minutes. Watch this. So how did our church do in the video? I'm gonna tell you now. Awesome. I, I was crying inside that beard. I cannot believe the people in this church. The number of people that prayed with me and brought me food, just watch and see. Bringing us something to eat this morning. Here's a coffee. A little coffee to keep you warm. 
Let's just pray for you real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, so thankful, Lord, that you brought this man to your church on your day, Lord. We are so blessed that he is here. You're welcome to come inside. We'd love to have you. You right. can come in if you want. <laughs> That's all right. But I got some water for you. And uh, something more valuable. It's the word of God here. And God bless you. Great guys. Oh man. <laughs> I might try that at some time. But that was awesome. I was so blessed by what those, I mean, they didn't know, of course, that he had a microphone under that beard. And the folks were going up, hey, God bless you. Hey, got something to keep you warm. And I love the guy who says, I got something even better for you the Word of God. And I love the fact that the family comes up and says, you can come on inside to the homeless fella. And the daughters say, yeah, you can come in. You, it's okay to come to church. It's our opportunity now. And God's given this, this, this great time. Here's what we need. In fact, City Church, you can cut this now. And you can, you'll, be, you'll be sharing with uh, the deacon over the needs there. But for our family here, may I share with you that... Uh, this started a long time ago because we just wanted to help somebody. And then now it's got a life of its own, but it happens every year because people care enough to do something for somebody else. We need 40 turkeys. I asked the other day, how many do we have? This, this past week, seven. We have seven turkeys? We will have 40 before next Sunday. I absolutely trust God's going to do that. And in our service here, we need 15 people who will say, are you kidding me? A turkey? Now you guys were awesome with peanut butter. Now we need a turkey. Cooked, sliced, and if you'll bring it next week, then what happens is when you start saying, when we're going to be in our service here next Sunday morning, the people start lining up at 7, 7 in the morning, and our doors don't open till 11. So now what we do is we play music while they line around the block, and we give them coffee and danishes when they're waiting to get in and get a haircut or their beard trimmed or a meal. And I say this every year. See, we've got folks who are going to sit down, and I encourage folks, if you've got children, you'll want to bring them along. One of the greatest lessons you'll ever be able to show your little he or she is how blessed and how well God has cared for you and how everyone in our community doesn't have it quite like you. It's a great, great lesson. It's a life changer. First things first. Can we get folks who will say, Count me in. I'm going to Stater Brothers, Albertsons. I'm going to Trader Joe's. I'm getting a turkey. Great. Oh, man. Cut, uh, uh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now, there's other stuff for you guys. Thank you so much. But great. 15. Now, guys, please, you got to call the church. If, uh, those hands going up, the Bible says, let your yay be yay, your nay be nay. With your hands going up, that means great. There is 15 more turkeys, and please, it has to be cooked at home uh, um, by laws and stuff like that. And then um, I'm going to ask you when we're done, let's see, if you walk, see this, well, you can't see him. Pastor Dave, um, will it be at the table there that folks who are signing up for turkeys, where do you want them to sign up at? Oh, good, good. So for all of you 15, could you walk right out to the information center there, sign up. Thank you so much. Let's give a hand to our family. <laughs> 15 more turkeys like that. That is great. So 
We'll dismiss in the next five or six, seven minutes. And so please sign up. That lets us know you'll be bringing those back. Great. Also, what we need is all sorts of other, I mean, tons of stuff from stuffing to desserts to uh, uh, you know, uh, string beans and, you know, the vegetable type stuff. Now, can I see the hands who said, I'll do something? Great. Oh, man, you guys, <laughs> you love it. When we're done this morning, can you please go outside right next door, not the information center, but right next to it, that little, that, that, the, the uh, resource center, which is right behind it. If you'll walk over there and we'll let you know, string beans, uh, uh, muffins, uh, pumpkin pie, whatever it is. And if all of us do our part in second service, we'll have more than enough. Get it? Great family fan. Can we give a hand to these folks? That is fantastic. Absolutely great. Oh, man. And uh, um, if we have any other folks who are good at, we're, we, I think we've got five hairstylists now, but the people line up. And uh, some, they come with the, with the beards and the long hair. And it's so fun to say it. And then you see it, that when we get done with them, they look like Brad Pitt and Denzel Washington. It is so amazing. These kids, you can't even recognize them. Then they come out all dapped out, which is really great. If you are a hair cutter and you're going, oh man, I cut hair all the time, we'd love to use you. And let me say, you'll have fun. We got music in there. The people, this is the first time they let anyone in their hair and to groom them for nothing. And it's a big deal. Then we give them hygiene items. We've also got kids outside. We've got jumpies coming. We have a magician coming. We've got all of these things coming to bless the 70 or 80 kids that are spellbound in a room. And this guy is doing all this magic and then shares the love of Jesus Christ while he's doing what he's doing. It is a whole lot of fun. And then if you come here next Sunday morning and then you go over there to serve, as soon as you get there, you'll see people lined around and people coming from everywhere. Under bridges, on the streets, in canyons. And you treat them with the same dignity you would give to mom and pops at Thanksgiving because Jesus died for them like he did for you and I. And it's just a wonderful time. And then we get to experience what the Lord says, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. We're going to do this. We're going to take a second offering right now. We, we probably do this maybe twice a year. But this offering is for the dear friends who are coming so we have the resources to be able to pay for it. We're not trying to do nothing but represent him and help somebody else. So this day, can you, I think they use the term dig deeper and what can you and I do for somebody else? Our, help, our host are gonna prepare to come. If you can't, for some reason, I understand it, but I'll tell you, we have a great church called City Church, which is just two miles from where we're going to be next Sunday. They're going to their church service, then they're getting in a big new venture bus, and they're going to go up and experience all the wonderful things that these folks are as well. As you give today, please know every nickel is going to help folks who have far less than us. Let's prepare to receive if we can. Let's pray. Father, thanks for a church. Lord, I love seeing that video and that pastor saying he was crying in his beard. Well, Lord, inside my heart is softened, it is warmed, and I'm in awe. Thank you for the fixings, the stuffing, the desserts, the turkeys, the love that we get to show other folks because we represent you. As we give now, please use every nickel to allow us to help people living in canyons and on the streets in Oceanside, in Vista, San Marcos, as far east as Escondido. Help us bring joy. Help us bring Jesus. And show us, yes, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Thank you. Wouldn't want to be at any other church in the United States. 
than this wonderful family here. Be pleased, Lord. They're doing it because they love you. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, like to say, as our prayer partners come to the front, like to say thank you for today and for last week and the week before that. You fed hundreds of families simply by bringing peanut butter. Hundreds and hundreds of families. They were blown away. That one church brought so much. We filled up bins to overflowing because you love people in the name of Jesus. We could have had three times the turkeys just by calling out for turkeys here because you love Jesus. And he said, love other people. And uh, it's days like this. I just go, Lord, thank you for a front row seat and watching you work. Can we thank the Lord, all of us, for his good. Man, fantastic. And family, congratulations on your baby dedication. That was something special. God bless you all. Hey, our prayer partners are here. Any need you've got, we want to encourage you. Come on down to the front. Remember, all the ones who are going to bless with the turkey, you want to cook it. And if I didn't pick out you, you go, oh, I really want to give a turkey. Just go sign up. Believe me, we will sure use it. And all the fixings and stuff, just turn right around from the info center and you'll be able to sign up on our biggest needs there. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, it's so good to be with you. Father, we want to thank you one more time for our veterans. We get to enjoy you because of their efforts. Thank you for them. And Lord, thanks for Paul. Then in a bad situation, he teaches us how to have joy. Show us how to get there. We're feeling it right now. For all those 15 minimum that go out and sign up, thank you for their turkeys, for all the others, for the desserts, the fixings, all that other stuff. As they go out and don't walk off this campus until they say, here's what I want to do or what's the need I want to provide. Bless this church. Bless every household because of the love of these dear folks. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, New Venture. Have a great, great week.